My name is Mary Sullivan, Mary E. Sullivan. And you're going to be looking at that. <laughs> Mary, e. Mary E. Sullivan, yes. and I am currently the Executive Vice President of CSEA. And I'm holding this position since um, 1994. Good. All right, I'm going to start with this question. What's your first, very first recollection of CSEA? How did you first become aware of CSEA? My first recollection of CSEA? Mm -hmm. Well, I started at Herkimer County right after graduation as a social worker. And CSEA was the bargaining agent for the Herkimer County employees. And probably about a year after I was there, they asked me if I wanted to sign a membership card when I first got there. I did, although I was a probationary employee. About a year after I was there, having no interest, contact, affiliation with anyone from CSEA at that level for that year, aside from the dues deduction. Uh, one of the women who, appear, who was the president of the unit at the time, her name was Frances Musica, she worked in our uh, accounting department, was coming around and talking to people, asking if anyone was interested in running for office. They were about to do unit office or elections at that time, back way back when. Uh, this was in 1970, or 71, they had two-year terms. I mean, we've escalated our involvement since then, but we, back then we were electing people every two years. So being the wise, smart mouth person I am, when uh, asked these silly questions, I said, sure. And she said, well, which position would you like to run for? And I said, president. And lo and behold, a few months later, there I was. Now, remind, going back to the fact that I have had no contact with this organization, have no clue what it's about, have never bargained a contract, handled a grievance, or been interested in any of that, I am now the president of the Herkimer County Unit about to go into negotiations for a contract. And to make matters worse that this is my first contract, I have no training, no experience across the table representing the county is my old high school guidance counselor, <laughs> Bill Trainer. So it was kind of like a benevolence. These 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 guys were these legislators were, and they're most there are they are predominantly male to this day in that legislature, uh, and very conservative Republican, by the way. It was difficult enough that he was the, the chief negotiator, but he had this condescending, patronizing attitude. Here is my old high school person. Plus, I'm not really thrilled with this union stuff anyway. And here me, I don't know anything. I don't know anything technically, but I have to say I knew something because when they kept giving us a hard time about doing it their way and taking what they wanted, I had learned enough by that point to stand up and say, we're at impasse, and I walked out. Nearly giving, as I, under, as I found out later, nearly giving my old guidance counselor a heart attack because <laughs> the union had never pulled that with them before. They were used to one of the middle-aged women who'd been around a long time, and they just danced through things. Here, is, here am I, this, I don't want to say I'm a kid because I wasn't at that time. I was in my 20s. But they weren't used to this having come right out of college liberal thinking individual who happened to also be a woman, which they weren't used to in that sense. So it was a kind of a neat little experience because then I got outside and I, my knees were shaking like crazy because I'm thinking to myself, what have I done? And I did it well because we had a contract not that long afterward and got what, mostly of what we wanted. And that's how I got started. Wow. So it's quite a beginning. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Now, you say you didn't know anything about CSE, but you must have learned fast. I didn't have much of a choice. I started to read whatever I could get my hands on. Back in those days, we had no real education and training department. You kind of flew by the seat of your pants. What was good for me is that the local president at the time, Mike Sweet, didn't like to do much wandering around, so he would send me and a couple of others to region meetings. And I'm from the central region, Region 5. And I'm from local government as well. The union was predominantly state-directed. 
by the state employees, that's how the union was formed. So we were kind of, I don't want to say second class citizens because of the way that sounds, but we were sort of off to the side. We weren't the focus of a lot of attention. So we sort of gathered ourselves together. And there were a couple of guys from Broome County, Carlo Guardi and Angelo Vallone, who were, no matter where the conference was, and we were a conference and we weren't regions yet. They would bring some salami and some pepperoni and some cheese and some beer and some soda. And those of us in local government would gather in their room and we would talk about things like, what are you doing in negotiations? What kind of grievances are you seeing? In this very social setting. So it was like a self-help group. And we learned about a lot of things from each other. Uh, later on, as I got a little more involved in the organization, I did learn about the state division in a similar fashion, again, with my brothers and sisters in Region 5. Uh, it was not a very detailed um, learning experience at that, at that time, but it was something more than I knew. And little by little, the local government group in Region 5 became more predominant. They sort of came up as equals. And I have to say that Jimmy Moore, who is the president of Region 5 now and was then, had a great deal to do with that. He listened to us. Uh, we were doing things on Friday nights at the programs once he, we became regents and he became president. We would do a state meeting and a local government meeting in schools. Schools were, can, back we were known as the state division and the county division, actually. And the schools came under that county di division. And he made a very bold step many, many years ago, he got rid of both of those and said, we aren't state and we aren't local government or county. We're Region 5 representatives. Let's all get in one room on Friday night and let's all talk about topics of interest to everyone rather than this separatist thing. And it was politically dangerous because a lot of the local government people weren't sure they wanted to get in with the bullies, as some of them perceived state employees to be, which they really weren't. One just doesn't know a hell of a lot about the other, and that's you know, like so many other things in this world. But it's, uh, it's worked for years. Um, nobody does it anymore. It used to be done in almost every region in the state. It's not done anymore to the point of separate meetings at conferences. There are sometimes, some regions do have workshops on certain weekends that deal with issues for local government. And the state doesn't get included. But it's not predominant in the organization. And I think that was, he was, uh, um, a groundbreaker in, in breaking down that barrier. I bet you today he wouldn't think of himself as that, but it was really a couple of us that were local government leaders who were officers with, eventually I became a region officer, um, that convinced him that we had to try this or we would never ever get together. And we did that. I became local president probably, well, four years after I became unit president. Mm -hmm. Or no, two years. This is the sordid past of the organization. Oh, our union, our local president uh, w had been uh, somewhat involved and did attend region, what were called conference meetings then. When we s converted, when the, when the uh, uh, Constitution was amended to create regions, which is how we exist, our structure exists today, uh, Mike Rand, for third vice president of the central region against two women. One's name I don't remember, the other's name was Eleanor Percy from Jefferson County. Uh, Mike won, to much to the chagrin of those two women who had been much more active, but this is like what we talked about, 1976, somewhere around in there where big deal there was a lot of women in the union, the men ran the show. So Mike had a clear shot at it running against two women. Well, after a while, Mike sort of like laid back a little bit more. He wasn't doing too much. He started sending me as his rep to the board of directors. Back then, there was no rules. Now you cannot send a voting representative to the board. You could send a, a, a proxy then. You could actually vote the vote. That's not. Uh, how we handle it now. So he would send me to Albany. The first time he sent me, the treasurer of the local said to me, Mary, collect your toll receipts, 
keep track of your mileage. When you get back, uh, give me a voucher, and I'll pay you for having attended the board meeting representing Herkimer County. So I said, okay, Linda, no problem. I got back, and I called her up, and I said, Linda, you don't have to pay me for anything. She said, why? I said, well, when I got there, they gave me a voucher. They told me how to fill it out, and I have to send it back to Albany, and CSCA headquarters will pay. Well, I won't tell you what she said then, unless you want to hear some, some cursing on the tape. But she said, Mary, he's been going to those meetings for years. And I've been paying him. You mean they've been paying him too? And I said, apparently, that's the way it is. Well, it gets better. We then found out he was also doing the same thing at the region as a region officer. So we go to the president, Linda and I went to the president of the region at that time, Dick Cleary, who blew us off like we were no big deal. Well, it was a big deal to us. So elections for the local were coming up shortly, and Mike was planning to run, and I told him, Mike, here's what we found out. I'm running against you. He said, oh, I'm not running. <laughs> that was how I became local president for 16 and a half years. But uh, this is how the unions change, the drastic change in the structure, how we do business, how we protect the finances of the organization, which back, everything was very, very loosey-goosey. I mean, I remember getting the, my board authorized a, a huge contribution. Well, for us, it was huge, $500, to the local American Cancer Society, which you, you can't come near, you can't even take a nickel out of the treasury and do any more. That's not... It's not allowed with the membership's money. And it has a lot to do with the way we look at why we have the money, and also has a lot to do with the oversight of all the people that watch us, mm -hmm. the Labor Department and the IRS and everybody else who's got a chance to get at us. Mm -hmm. So it was different. It wasn't as different, I don't think. Um, I mean, way back when they first did, they didn't really have a lot of collective bargaining agreements. Mm -hmm. But I came into the union, I think, at the time when we started to move towards becoming more of a union and less of an association. Yeah, yeah it sounds like it was time to get professional. Well, yeah, maybe that's a, word, a, good, yeah. a good word, professional. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was around not too long after that that we started our conversations with AFSME. Yeah, I want to talk about that a lot because this is the 25th anniversary of that, of that affiliation. Mm -hmm. How did that, where, where did that start from? Well, see, I wasn't in the powers that be at that time. Yeah. So I can only tell, tell you what I've heard about. CSEA was, at the time, taking a lot of hits, people challenging their representation in various bargaining units. No one except for the PS&T group has taken on any of our state bargaining units. PS&T, professional, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Up until that time, all these challenges were coming to, from... Um, for the local government side, and then we lost ps &T. And I think M Bill McGowan and McDermott and the, those who were officers at the time uh, decided that there was, we had to stop the bleeding somehow. And whether AFSME approached us or we went to AFSME, I'm not sure. I have no idea. But I do know that there was a, an affiliation agreement worked out where there'd be a four-year honeymoon. And uh, during that time, we would see if the arrangement would work. And there was an awful lot of AFSCME staff in the state, uh, an awful lot of Bob McEnroe and Steve Reagan's drive. And uh, there's somebody else whose name I can't remember because I tried to remember it last night. But maybe it will come to me later. But primarily, uh, Bob McEnroe was the lead, lead guy here. And uh, oh, they, we put together an affiliation com committee to study, study the affiliation, which Bob Latimer chaired and, and st our now Treasurer Malone was part of. And they traveled around the state trying to explain to people what the affiliation would mean. Uh, we would substantially increase our dues contribution because of it. Uh, at people asking questions. Uh, AFSCME was always with us. They were at every conference we did, no matter where we were. We were in Long Island, uh, if we were in... Uh, having a conference in Syracuse, if we were having something in Buffalo, they were always with us. There was an uh, ever-present AFSCME piece, which continues today, by the way. 
They were always there to, to hear the concerns, see what they could help with. And I'm going to tell you this little story, which some people may not appreciate down the line, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. I can remember being at a convention at the Concord, which was our convention place for years. And in the Concord is this huge, huge bar. It sort of snakes like this, oh, yeah. in and outs, yeah. indentations. And one of my memories of that, one of those conventions, was during this affiliation honeymoon. Well, actually, no, it was the engagement. The honeymoon came later. The engagement we were in, involved with. And a bunch of us were at the bar. And why I made this observation, maybe it's because I'm a people watcher, I don't know, and it stays with me to this day. Down at this end of the bar were a large number of CSEA staff, all dressed in three-piece suits, buying each other drinks. Over here at this side of the bar was Bob McEnroe and Steve and this other guy whose name I can't remember with in a similar dress to you. They had taken off their their jackets, put them on the back of the chair, rolled up their sleeves, loosened their ties. They were buying us the drinks. Now, I knew that our money was being spent at that end of the bar, and I knew at this end of the bar our money was probably being spent too in some form. But at least they drank with us instead of on us. And it's always stayed with me, and it was part of why I supported the affiliation. I mean, I knew the, all the the good reasons, the politically correct reasons, the financially correct good reasons, the self-preservation reasons. But the personality of the AFSCME staff who worked with us at that time and their willingness to listen to us, to give us advice, to share things with us, to have, share a, a, a sad situation, a bad situation, or a laugh, it was really something that personalized the union to me, AFSCME of the union. And I think it did the same thing with a lot of our other leadership. I think they knew people's names. There, is, there are people that are AFSCME staffers, like Steve Regenstein, for instance, who still has friendships, connections to people he worked with when he was here. Some of the people in Westchester County and Long Island, which was primarily the area he was in, but still asking about each other, talking to each other. And in CSEA, it's with something with most of the staff that doesn't that does not happen, and that's not going to be popular for me to have having said that, but it's my observation, and I think it's it's carried through the years where because there's not that kind of relationship among a lot of our staff and a, and our leadership, it makes for a very difficult situation sometimes when it's necessary for the two groups to come together for a success in a, in a project or a a, pro, a problem. And I think that that's the thing that stands out most to me about the AFSCME affiliation, aside from being locked in a room to vote, vote for the affiliation. <laughs> well, the board of directors had to approve the affiliation first, and I was on the board of directors by then. <coughs> so they took us to, I'm not even, I don't know if I even remember where we were. One of the meeting areas around here, it might have been the Polish club, it might have been the Italian American club, God knows, it could have been the best Western hotel for all I can remember, because I don't. They put us in a room, and the room was locked down. You could go to the bathroom, but a staff person escorted you to the bathroom, waited for you outside the door, because by the way, I got escorted by Joe Dolan, <laughs> and I had to leave the room. And we spent a number of hours debating the pros and cons of going with this affiliation. They didn't want anyone out of the room, because they didn't want to leak the outcome prematurely. And, and, and over a little bit of time, we finally took the vote, and we voted to, and agreed to affiliate, to go through the affiliation agreement, which we then had to take to the delegates for their approval. But that was an interesting little afternoon. And all of us uh, who were supportive of the affiliation ended up in the AFSCME New York State, AFSCME New York office, having a little bit of champagne later on. But it was, it was, I think, a good thing. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you saw a model for a union there and AFSCME that you didn't see physically. Yeah. Well, I also saw something else. I oh. saw that AFSCME would leave us alone and not force mm -hmm. their structure on us, which over time I've come to realize is complete shambles compared to ours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, see, things got turned around. Huh? Well, I th yeah. recently was put out a committee called the Jurisdiction Committee. Mm -hmm. And initially it was to look at, in my eye, from, from my point of view, it started with jurisdictions on organizing. It is now evolving into a looking at the structure of AFSCME locals, which I can't believe how confusing they are. I mean, you've got all kinds of workers thrown into the same local, all of them trying to get out. <laughs> so that because you're doing something that has nothing to do with my work, how can you negotiate or how can I support your negotiations? Because what you need and what I need are so diametrically opposed to each other. So it should be an interesting, I think as they charter new locals, They'll, they'll be doing it under a new set of guidelines. Yeah. But right now, it's unreal. I could not believe how goofy they were. <laughs> See, when we have a local, like for example, the education department employees that are down the street here, that's a local. All that are in that local are employees of the state who work for the education department. With AFSCME, you could have the uh, parking, uh, uh, parking meter attendants, the cops, well, maybe not the cops, but possibly the cops, the DPW workers, in a local. We do that, at, but we do it at, in the municipal level as, low, as, as, uh, as a bargaining unit based on the employer rather than the, so you could be housing authority people, you could be police department people, you could be part of the sheriffs and be all, have different employers, but all lumped in an AFSCME local. The CSEA doesn't do it that way. And so it's confusing to us. So now AFSCME can learn from I don't know. They learned a little bit about financial standards codes from us, but I'm not sure that they want to hear about structure. <laughs> but not that long ago, there was a little bit of a crisis in AFSCME, in one of the AFSCME Council's financial problems. Math, huge amounts of investments in misuse of funds. And they started to look at training. And I was just flabbergasted that they didn't have a code like we do. But we're, see, we're older than AFSCME. <laughs> How about, yeah, what's well, you're just shy of 100 years, CSEA. I don't know how old AFSCME is. Um, you have to find out. Started in Wisconsin in the 30s. In the 30s. Yeah, so it's probably, we're probably 30 years old. Yeah, I know we did Golden. 86 was the 50 years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So now you got pretty pretty involved with, uh, with uh, AFSCME as well as CSEA. Well, not for a while. I mean, I was, I was part of that group that supported it, yeah. but I wasn't really involved with AFSCME. I got very involved with CSEA. Yeah, let's talk about that then. Well, I was doing, I was, as I said, we tossed our, our local president there, and it became a, automatically the board rep because I was the local president. That was, what, 73? Uh, mm, 74. I don't even know my own bio, to tell you the truth, <laughs> by dates. Um, so I came down and did, we used to meet in, in, in our old building in Elk Street. We'd meet in the morning in the basement. On Elk Street? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was where CSEA headquarters used to be. Yeah. And we used to meet in the basement for the executive committees, the county executive committee and the state executive committee, and then to come together as a board after lunch in the afternoon. And that was a real education because there was some real, um, old heroes there right. and, and they would go out to lunch and have a few cocktails and the debate could get very lively in the afternoon when they'd stand up and scream at Wenzel who was president then and I remember one time we were sitting there and we were going along and I think Ro Jim Romer was talking and Jimmy Moore jumps out of his chair points his finger at Wenzel and starts screaming the son of a bitch is asleep, is asleep. the son of a bitch is asleep and the whole place just went up in a roar because he was he was sound asleep at the, at, the, at the dais. But those were the fun days. We used to, we were, we were just learning. And I, was lear I learned a lot from my colleagues. Uh, they were really, really helpful and very supportive. Um, I walked into a county exec meeting one time, and, and I hadn't been there very long, and Sam McGavro, who I have a great deal of respect for, was the chair then, and he said, um, how would you like to be on the personnel committee? Now, this was one of the committees of the board, I mean, big shot committees. But we were all overrun at that. We were still at the PS&T group was still like dominate us. And so I went on the personnel committee and learned an awful lot, an awful lot from, from, from Genevieve Clark and, and even Ellis Adams, as crazy as he was, and some of the other folks that sat on that committee, which was a basis for learning a lot about the union. 
you know, people come into the organization and they don't learn about the organization. They don't take time to read the constitutions. They have no clue how we operate. I mean, it's, it's very sad to me today to run into people who I know have been activists for 20 years or more, and they don't know the most simple processes or requirements that our constitutions call for. And that's sad. But, but, you know, that's the way people are. So we moved into that. Then um, well, the other big funny thing we did was uh, Joe McDermott and Jimmy Moore, having the most board reps in their regions, used to pretty much control who went on board committees. So as I said, I got on this board committee early because there was a vacancy. It wasn't election time. So we got to a point where Jimmy said to me, we're going doing these board elections, and he said, uh, I want you to run for vice chair of local government, which was still county again at the time. I, by the way, was the one who amended the Constitution to make a local government, made us a little more professional. So I said, okay. So we did a couple of years as vice chair. And I was getting sick of this guy that was the chair. I mean, it all was, it was a staff run show, and I was still in that, I'm going to be a pain in the ass until somebody gets this right stuff. So I said to Jimmy, prior to the election for the chair and vice chair that year, I want to run for chair. You want to what? <laughs> so Liz Roney, who was the chair, was Joe McDermott's guy. Now he had to get Joe McDermott to agree that Liz Roney was going to go. This turns into, by the way, a Dolan story. So they put it all together. Jimmy said, don't you say anything to anybody until that night. Let's keep this under wraps. Don't want to sneak up on them. So he says, Le let me take care of it. So the night of the nominations and elections, Maureen Malone and I were very close friends, both of us Region 5. Maureen was going to nominate me. So Joel Dolan, prior to the meeting, comes up to Maureen. And he says to Maureen, can you nominate Lazzaroni tonight? And Maureen says, no, I can't. And he looked at her, and he thought a minute. And he said, oh my god. Mm -hmm. And then he figured out what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a landslide. We killed him. Wow. I mean, a few years later, when I had to hold my chair by four votes, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't, but that was very, that was politics. Mm -hmm. But I think we changed the way local government was perceived at the board level. I tried, that's what was my goal. When questions came to, from, the, from the group, I did not allow them to be directed to the staff as it had been done in the past. And the staff answered and the chair stood there. Talk to me and I will get your answers if I don't know that. You don't beat the staff up, you, don't, I, you elected me to lead this group. So we sort of evolved to that, um, from that. Uh, at the time, Pat Crandall was also chair of the state division. We were both from Region 5. We were riding, we were having a great time. But I really enjoyed doing that because I think during the seven years, not me personally, but I think the group took on a greater feeling of pride and took a bigger, um, um, stronger stand on their own issues and raised the level of attention to that division, which is badly needed because it is so different in structure and size from the state division. It takes a different kind of attention to make sure we don't have the problems that we, we sometimes do and are having now. So it sounds like a lot of this came out of Region 5. What is, is there something different about Region 5? I don't know. It's got to be water. in the water. <laughs> it is different. It's very different. Well, I don't know what the other regions are like because yeah. I didn't grow up in any of them. Right. But this, this, and it's still to this day, it's like a family, mm -hmm. which is the same way Region 2 is. Region 2 oh. is very much like a family. Mm -hmm. uh, people know about each other, per, know each other personally. They kind of look out for one another. It's been a really good learning experience. And as much of a pain in the ass as Jimmy Moore has been over the years, because politically we have had major, major fights, mm -hmm. and everybody in the organization knows it. He has done a, a lot. When he sees what the way is to go, he doesn't hesitate. Mm. He goes. Mm. And he's made changes in that region that have made it pro more progressive. He is the only 
probation workshop in the state for probation workers. And the classes that they offer gives those uh, probation officers professional credit, mm -hmm. which no other thing does, no other program in this organization does. He has a very active uh, health and safety committee, has had it for years. He, he just listens to what he hears and he reacts to it. He just doesn't put, mo you know, not every idea you're, you're, that's, uh, that's proposed to you as a leader is a good one. But if you hear one and then you test it, you take the time to test it with people, it sometimes comes to, to blossom in, in great and spectacular ways. Uh, I don't, you know, don't want to demean any of the other regions because I think in their ways they do, do what they do well and they do it in concert with the representatives that they deal with. But that's my home region mm -hmm. and it's, it's uh, that, that'll always be special. <laughs> Well, he's been the, the leader of that region for a long, longer than anybody. Longer together. than anybody. And so he's obviously been something. He's been it. He's been there a long, long time. Yeah. But he's not. He's never got. He hasn't gotten stale in the job. That's yeah, the that's see. That's yeah. that's the key because yeah. many times people are in the job a great many years, but they tend to remember what was yesterday, and don't look ahead to yeah, tomorrow. Like one year experience, twenty-five times instead of twenty. Yes, experience. exactly. Yeah, right. That's right. Well, you mentioned something about somebody, uh, Ellis, somebody. Ellis Adams. He was a, oh, he was a trip. Well, he a was a trip. Ellis Ella Adams was the chair of the director's personnel committee. He was from Dutchess County, mm -hmm. and he just was a trip. He was, mm -hmm. he was always looking. Um, f he was always chasing the girls. <laughs> his wife had will appreciate. I'm sure. <laughs> he thought he was a ladies' man, which he wasn't, but he was a lot of fun. He just was, mm -hmm. and he was very involved as chair. Uh, there were times that uh, certain staff people tried to backdoor him through me, um, and I wouldn't go. I just wouldn't go. Well, their ideas and our ideas were not the same. We were not. There was another person on the on the committee. Um, I just blanked. Genevieve Clark, who was a huge influence on me. I didn't know what I was doing there either. You know, they put you in the, you don't get any training, you just get a new job. No. So I go into this, uh, into this personnel committee not knowing what we're doing. And uh, we'd have these conversations and the debates and they would, Jimmy, in fact, Jimmy was on the personnel committee for a little while before he became region president because he was a board member as well for mental hygiene. And they'd all be blustering and blah, 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 blah. And Genevieve would lean over and say, don't listen to any of them. I'll talk to you later and tell you the real story. And she did. God rest her soul. She was a sweetie. Mm -hmm. And she was a toughie. She knew her business. She didn't mind sharing the knowledge she had. And I think that's a, that's a big thing that, that helped me growing up in CSEA, was there were so many people that were willing to share what they knew. Because they had, I think they had in, in the back of their mind, and if not the forefront, that one day they wouldn't be there and they needed to leave their experience, their knowledge to some bodies and not just one but a number of bodies. So the tradition and the history and the progress of CSEA would continue. And Genevieve was one of those people. Another one of them was um, Irving Flammenbaum from Long Island. Irving would call me up. We happened to live uh, when I was in Herkimer on the side of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Our street butted the church. And he would call me up on Sunday morning, and as you know, Irving was Jewish, and he would say, is that the church bells I hear, Mary? I'm not keeping you from church, am I? <laughs> and he did, he mentored me. He was the only vice president of the union that was local government. He sat with us at, at, on the dais when we had our local government executive committee meeting, and he, showed me a few things. He taught me a lot of things about people. I mean, I'm sure that there were at times, and I, that, that's true of many people, mm -hmm. even today, who want you to favor their opinion over someone else's, whether their opinion is really well, the best one or not. But he was like a mentor to me. He did, I did learn a lot from him, too, because he was the preeminent figure in local government at the time. He was a quite, a, quite a character. Of course, we've had a lot of them. Yeah. We well, still have them. <laughs> you still got them? Oh, good. Yes, we do. Right. I consider myself a character. Good. Well, I think that's what this, what we're doing is 
that's why it's important because you're, you're keeping the tradition alive of, of the past so people can read these transcripts, look at these tapes, or whatever, you know, if we do a booklet out of it or something at the 100th anniversary, they'll get the feeling of how CSEA got to be where it is today and, and what it means to be part of ASME and, you know. And I want them to get out of today, out of this tape, out of this history, is that if we don't mentor, and if we don't inform, if we don't train, if we don't teach, if we don't pass on the experiences that we as leaders have, you can have the biggest and the best education and training department if you want, mm -hmm. but if the mentoring doesn't come from those who are already there, what is the, what is the union going to be when we've left? And that's our obligation as leaders. That is our legacy. It's not just the conversations about the things that we went through, but the mentoring the individuals will follow us. That's why it meant so much. I, came, I, can, I grew up in a different generation of CSCA. It was just, I can remember going to a delegate meeting and having Bill McGowan recognize me and say hello and say my name, and it was like a movie star had greeted me. Maureen and I used to giggle like two babies because she was the same way about it. I have a picture when I was elected as president of the local in Herkimer County for the second time. I'm from Herkimer County, 350 members. That picture is of me, all four of the statewide officers, and the region president. Now, that's unheard of today. That's unheard of. And we are not bigger now, we're smaller. So it tells you about, it was more, it was like more personal. Yeah. It was really a more personal type of organization. And a lot of it has to do, I think, with, and I think, more, I know Maureen would agree with me, and there's a few others. We've talked about this before. For years, we went to the Concord, to the convention, and we all bitched and moaned and complained about it. But we've never been able to match the ambiance, the atmosphere of that place. Because people wandered around together. And I didn't know if you were a state employee or a schools worker or you worked for the Thruway Authority or you were a county employee. You were just a CSEA delegate like me. And we would hang out. Save me a seat at the bar. I'll be back in a few minutes, Frank. Uh, I'm going to go find uh, Gloria or I'm looking for Skip. It wasn't you might have had your meals in, in a group. See, what, why it was beautiful for me was I went to the conventions by myself. No one from my local wanted any part of it. Hmm. And for years, before I could get it into my contract, I was on my vacation. You were on your own time, and a lot of people in local government went through that. It wasn't just me. But you went from room to room, from party to party at night. Maybe you were with a couple people from your region, but I was never with anybody from my local, because there was nobody there. When I went to my very first convention, I got thrown into it, because again, back in the old days, Sweet wouldn't go, he sent me. And they used to make the people, the board members double up. And I got put in the room with the one of the women, Eleanor Percy again, who he had just beaten for region office, region third vice president. She and her delegates from Jefferson County took me under their wing that first week and taught me a lot of things, introduced me to people, which just isn't really done a whole of a hell of a lot anymore. And there was like a camaraderie. We were all locked up, literally, for five days in this airless joint. You know, you'd go outside in the front of the place, and that was as far as you would go because there was nowhere else to go around there. And we used to live together for five days. Now it's all different. We go to a convention. We're sometimes in multiple hotels. I got to stay where my local stays. I cannot go and see you because we're not in my local. And don't, heaven forbid, I should say to you, um, you got to go in this training group and not stay with me who's in your local. You know, God, oh, I got to stay. I can't leave him. You can't leave me. We're in the same local. Okie dokie. It's like people are joined at the hip these days. Yeah. And it's not everybody, and I mean like over, I'm over exaggerating yeah. it a little yeah. bit. 
but the loss of the opportunity for the camaraderie and the coming together of all types of segments of the union is lost because we aren't, when you're in New York City, we're all under one roof. But who the heck's going to stay hanging around New York City? Everybody's out and about if they're not in the, in the meetings or the training classes the first part of the week. They've got things to do. They're not captive. Same when we go to D.C. Everybody loves the convention in D.C. because of the history of the city and the things you can go and see. Again, no lockdown. There's too many other distractions where we are. So over time, the culture has changed. And until we get a bit of that culture shift back. Yeah, it sounds like the best place for the next convention would be an abandoned jail. You know, you know, you could be right. Uh, we'll go to Alcatraz next time. There you go. That'd be a great little trip, Alcatraz. God, go to the NASME convention in Las Vegas sometime. Talk about distraction. Yeah, Las Vegas. Not to be concentrated on it. Well, let's talk about AFSCME a little bit. I mean, you've been very active in AFSCME. I was. I really wasn't very active in AFSCME. I was put on. What the heck? You know, that's, somebody made that up. <laughs> Professional Employees Advisory Committee, when I first got to, when we first affiliated. We're going back to Anaheim next year, which is the site of the first convention we ever went to, which was a lot of fun. Tell me about that. Professor. First convention? Oh, well, it was a great convention because we were put in a hotel, which was also the hotel for the New York Yankees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, it was heaven for, for, yeah. for CSEA and the New York people. It was kind of strange. We didn't really know what to expect. We have a very, uh, we have our own convention, and their convention compared to our convention is very different. Although we have, over the years, borrowed a few things from the AFSCME's, AFSCME's process in, in conducting its business, but we were all kind of like awestruck. Um, we had been told by our international vice presidents to keep our mouth shut. Ooh, I just remembered something. No, tell me. You're gonna love this one too. But we, we did, we, we were awestruck by the size of it, uh, the order of it, the way things were shut down without any problem, you know, I'm talking too bad, bing, you're done. Because Jerry Wirth was president at the time. So we elected international vice presidents for the first time at that convention. And there were three candidates. Bill McGowan, who was our president, Joe McDermott, who was Region 4 president, and Irving Frommenbaum, who was Region 1 president. Now, I am um, the quasi kind of whatever leader of the local government division at this point. I'm the chair of the executive committee. And I guess I had thought, I didn't have as much, I thought more stature than I thought I did as the local government um, chair. So we go to this convention where we're going to have this election. At that time, we had two international vice presidents. We didn't have three like we do now. So we have the vote. And uh, there's no clear, you have to have 51% we have to get that much. So there's not a clear winner except Bill, our president. He's been elected. Now the next day, there's going to be a runoff between the two. Am I allowed to tell things that are that could get people in trouble yeah, later. Because it's all inside. Okay. So I have a f high school classmate who I haven't seen in years who lives in Los Angeles, or Simi Valley actually. Mm -hmm. She comes down to, a to Anaheim, doesn't tell her husband she's staying overnight, tells him a fib, call him up and tell him she's got car trouble so she can stay over and, mm -hmm. and join in some of the festivities we had that evening. So it's about 1.30 in the morning and we're both sleeping and the phone rings in my room. Now, I guess I should tell you that I was a staunch supporter of Irving Flammenbaum because he, to me, represented the local government side, Bill representing the state side. And on the phone is Judy Burgess, uh, Bill McGowan's assistant. They didn't call him executive assistant then. I don't know what we called him. Assistant to the president, I guess. Administrative assistant to the president. Anyway. Could I come to her room to talk about the international vice president's runoff election the next morning? And I said, well, yeah, I didn't want to. But my friend Donna, who is a very astute person, said, 
I'll find out what this is about. I, she says, now I'm curious. Like, she had no involvement in it. So I went, and there in the room with Judy Burdick is this Joe McDermott. And they spent an hour trying to convince me that the right thing to do was to give the position to McDermott. And I said no. And I held that position through the runoff, and Mr. Fahmanbaum won. So I guess at that point, Mr. McDermott figured out that there was something to, there was more substance to the Herkimer County rep than they probably figured out. I think those early, like those little early things I did gave me the opportunities that I have now, or I've enjoyed up to now. When you think about the fact that at one point, I had 350 members in Herkimer County. I became statewide treasurer. I succeeded the man who lived across the river from me in Mohawk, New York, which was like screwball -y. It just, it, it's amazing what things, how things happen. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, well, we asked about the first one. That's, uh, it was fun. It was fun. What was your work like? What was your yeah. uh, I didn't really know him at all. He was like very aloof and standoffish. Um, <laughs> he, he, um, I lost my job on the professional services committee, I think, because of, um, I think McEntee thought we were off close to Worf or something, I don't know. But what I remember most about Worf was when there was some difficulties within, between CSEA and, and them. I can't remember what the heck it was, though, why there was, Worf was mad at us for something. And we had a convention at the Concord. And at the time, Maureen Malone, my old pal, was working for AFSCME. She, right after the affiliation, a couple of people went to work for AFSCME, yeah. Maureen being one of them. And she was an AFSCME employee. And I don't know how the CSA, I can't remember what CSA wouldn't do that Jerry wanted us to do. Maybe it was raise our dues to do something, or I don't know. But anyway, they had these midnight raids. Now, I knew what was going on because Maureen was a friend. And I think that from particular convention, we, she was it's staying in my room. We had a double rooms with two beds, and then we'd have, if we had the need for somebody to stay, they'd stay. And they were getting up, the AFSCME staff was getting up at like 4 o'clock in the morning. We did this two mornings in a row. And like, I'm in cahoots with everybody because they're all in my room. Like, I don't even know what the hell they're doing this for. Like, I don't remember. Maureen might remember that. And they're out firing, slingering, throwing things under, sliding things under people's door to, to, to put pressure on McGowan to do whatever. I don't, rem I can't for the life of me remember that. But see, it wasn't important. The fun was in the, in the slingering and the midnight runs in the early morning hours. Yeah. It was, it was weird. It was very weird. And I don't think it was that long after that that, uh, that Jerry Worth passed away and, and Jerry McEntee became president. He wasn't president that long into the affiliation. Did you get to know McEntee when you were in your affiliation with uh, Somewhat. I mean, I don't know him really well, but I know Jerry. He's very personable. Yeah. Yeah. I have a great deal of respect for Jerry Wirth, for Jerry McEntee. I think Jerry McEntee should have been the president of the AFL-CIO because I think the labor movement would have moved a lot farther along than we have under Sweeney. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry is very much more progressive. I think he's got a vision that eludes a lot of people. Uh, I was really, really proud of him when we had the, the conference we had in January, the fiscal crisis, political crisis conference. That, I mean, he was so mad that, that he was mad the whole time we were there because of the screw ups in the elections in, in the fall and this idiot Bush and everything else. And I told them then, I said, you know, just go for it. We'll be there for you because you're on the right path. Mm -hmm. He had that, that town meeting. Jerry's been very progressive, and he's always been very supportive. If we needed anything uh, in any way, shape, or form for any reason, we had major deserts in our union mm -hmm. right after um, McDermott was elected. I mean, we were elected in, we started our term in July of 88. And, and by 89, January of 89, I had been shipped to Westchester, and 
Danny had been shipped to Long Island because we had major deserts in Westchester and Nassau counties. Mm -hmm. And I spent a year and a half in Westchester County. I was the first administrator, which we didn't, Joe wrote into the Constitution after he created it. <laughs> we had to do something. Yeah. But McEntee was right there with staff. He was right there with money. Uh, he's always been there for us. In fact, that dog that's out there in the lobby, that's a cute little story. Last year, we were in New York City for a CSEA convention, and our delegates had asked us to go, and we happened to be able to book it the week of 9-11. So we had our own 9-11 ceremonies. Prior to going there, one of our delegates had come approached me about uh, adopting a rescue dog. Uh, for $10,000, you could, uh, an organization could purchase these ceramic or whatever material dogs which were being placed throughout the city of New York for display and the money would go to sponsor a rescue dog mm -hmm. training in California this organization because the dogs were used to search for survivors on 9-11 and I couldn't figure out how the hell am I going to do this I think it's a great idea but how the heck am I going to do this so I talked to Medeiros and Medeiros said he would approach Danny well, I waited and I waited. And I didn't hear anything. And so he said he hadn't had a chance. We're at the, we're, we're this, we're at the, uh, we're at the uh, memorial service that we're doing. And Steve is telling me, I haven't had a chance. I'm hell with us. So as we're leaving, Jerry and Danny are walking away together. So I go up behind them, put my arm around each one's shoulder. Jerry immediately grabs his wallet. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want, Mary? <laughs> so I told them the story. I told them about the project. Each org, each union threw in $5,000, and we put in an additional sum and bought the, the dog. What happened to the others in December, they were auctioned. And additional proceeds would then went to the Rescue Dog Foundation. We chose to buy ours. Uh, he sits out in the lobby, Union Pride. It was in the New York City office for a very a long number of months, and we guess we're going to take it around the state. Yeah. But that's one of my favorite Jerry McEntee stories. Yeah. He's very, very personable. He's very, very determined. Um, I do have a great deal of respect for him, and I do think that the, the labor movement in the country would be much better off if Jerry McEntee was president of AFL-CIO. I really, really do. We're going to sit through a, all the politician interviews again next board meeting. I'm not looking forward to that. But he's right He's right in there. He knows. Yeah. He knows. I mean, we elected Clinton. I don't care what anybody else wants to take credit for that. We elected Clinton. And he was very good to us in his way. And we're right in there for the next Clinton, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <All right. laughs> ask me. What else about ask me? What else? Yeah. You've been uh, delegate to every ask me convention since the affiliation. Yes. First is a Region 5 delegate. I was an officer of Region, that was another one of my little jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't little. I started out, I was treasurer of Region 5. Um, the treasurer at the time that I started decided she was going to retire. And again, I'm lost for a name. So Jimmy asked me if I would serve. Now, I've never been a treasurer in my life. I've always been president of some of these things. So I said, yeah, how, how could it be? Well, I found out. He, I get approved at the executive board, which is the core requirement for CSEA replacements. And I go to my first officer's meeting, at which time I'm supposed to present a treasurer's report. So Jimmy says, uh, okay, Mary, can you have treasurer's board? And I said, the balance in the, this account is that, and that account is that. And he just, no, 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 no. I mean, he was like ready to kill me. He said, I'll let it go that time, but that's not what I mean by a treasurer's report. Now, like I said, I had no clue. So I went back and looked at everything. And by the time I was done with him, he had, every time he had a meeting, I had three pages legal size of reports, which apparently proved sufficient because all the time I served as treasurer of Region 5, I was asked a question on my report once because there was everything was there. I don't know, unless you wanted to know what time it was, it pretty much was in front of you, which goes a lot, again, to credibility. That's why it was out there. 
Um, I remember writing, I think it was 400 checks. We had a school unit, a school unit nine in Syracuse, City of Syracuse School District, which went on strike. And I don't know the year, but I can tell you Jimmy Carter was president then. He was the president of the unit, and all the rest ended up being invited to the White House after the strike was over. And we had this fund we put together, which we're not, can't call a strike fund, but a fund, like a welfare fund, or a sunshine fund. So we got money out of headquarters to supplement the folks that had, that had been on strike, supplement uh, their non-income because they weren't, didn't get any money. And I had to write one check. We calculated the time they were on the picket line and all that. And it all was calculated, and everyone received a check from the region. So when I got done, I had spent everything but $4.98. So I called down here to Dave Stack, who was there here then, and I said, I'm going to write you a check for that. He says, keep it. It's worth, not worth double court to put it back in our account. <laughs> But we used to have a good time. So I did that. And as a result of being a region officer, when we started electing delegates, the first time that the AFSCME, our group went to the AFSCME convention, they went to Las Vegas, the 10 officers. And then it wasn't until two years later, the, Af the Anaheim convention, where we took a full delegation. And our delegates are elected by members regionally. Um, and I, as a region officer, I was put on the slate, and I've been in, uh, since since I've been here in Albany as a statewide officer. Uh, we changed our constitution, or changed our process. Actually, we used to have to run as a statewide officers when I was treasurer, run as a part of the slate in Region Five. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there were two of us that were Region Five: Secretary Irene Carr and myself. Mm -hmm. So that took two slots away from representatives of the region. So we changed the process and made the four statewide officer positions automatic delegates, mm -hmm. which then didn't bite into any of the region's uh, allocations because now we would be biting three times. It was all three of us except for the president, our, our region five people. Yeah. So we started that way. And then when I got to be treasurer, I became a delegate first through that process and then the automatic. So we've been to, uh, I don't know how many conventions have I been to, 10, 11? Sounds like everyone's a learning experience. Yeah, it's been fun because yeah. everything's. It's I, I often say to people, it's it's my involvement in the organization. If I had not become involved in the union, there's no telling how I would have ever gotten to the places, or if I ever would have gotten to the places I've been able to go to. I mean, I went to. Um, uh, Japan a few years ago to the PSI convention as an AFSCME representative. I've been asked to go to other places, but they always ask me when there's a major crisis in the world and then I get nervous and won't go. Mm. I get, I'm not going anywhere when there's people throwing bombs and things. Yeah. It's, I don't need, I have enough trouble right here. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a couple more questions. What are you most proud of in your CSEA career? Well, all the things No. Can you prioritize some? The proudest thing I do, that I'm most proud of, is that I mentor people. I try to help people do, uh, learn and do for themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of doing for. It's like that, it's that, that old adage, you know, teach a man to fish and he can eat every forever. Uh, I try to work it that way. I, I, I think I've done. A, a decent job of, of trying to help some people over the years. Uh, I'm frustrated by the fact that um, I don't think we've done enough of it. And it's, it's getting to, I'm getting to the end of my career. And um, I'm concerned about what my union will look like. Not that I'm so great, or not those that I serve with are so great either. I mean, I think we're all dedicated, we've all worked for the best interest of the union and its members. But what do we have coming behind us? And what have we, have we done enough to ensure that there's a pool, mm -hmm. not a specific individual or small group of individuals, but a pool. And not only at our level, 
but at the region level, at the local level, and most importantly at the unit level, where the action is. I mean, we can sit here at Albany and, and put out paperwork and, and make demands and develop regulations and all kinds of things that we can do, but if we haven't created a strong base, the organization folds, because that's where we, that's where we live, is, is at the base. And with the flurry of, of early retirement incentives over the last few years in, in you know, Pataki, everybody, you know, Pataki thinks he did us a favor. There's people who think Pataki did us a favor. He didn't do nothing but dis dissipate the experience that work in the state division, not just in the union, but work, make the state run, and has done no favors for us in the organization because we've lost some of our senior members, our senior leaders. And the fact that a lot of them didn't do that train behind them, get their VPs ready, or some of the other than other people ready. <clears throat> I don't know how it's going to play out. I just don't know how it's going to play out over the next five years. I know I've got met several conversations with Danny about this, and we wring our hands over it, and then we pledge to do something about it, but it, it can't be two people with an idea. We've got a couple things that are rolling around as far as doing things. Um, in fact, we're going to kick something off on a Thursday afternoon called Building Solidarity, which is, in essence, a program to put back the Concord without having to go there. Um, it, it comes actually out of the Human Rights Committee that I, I sit as uh, officer liaison to. We've been doing a program called um, NCBI Training, uh, National Coalition Building Institute. Well, we've been doing that, and it's 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 become it's kind of like ebbed. <coughs> Excuse me. The interest in pretending attending this, the classes are are less and less mm -hmm. because those who wanted to go have gone. Those who don't want to go are never going to go. You can't going to get it, and then there's dragging, kicking, and screaming. And we came to the conclusion. We discussed this the, because the committee is very supportive of the program. That it's in a lot of people's minds. It's it's a, it's a training that deals with the differences between our white and our black members or activists, which is not what it is. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people get that in their heads, mm -hmm. like that there was a reason to go to, or like that whole thing that there was really a reason to go to Iraq. It's like that. So anybody could tell you something often enough, you start to believe it. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to come up with another way to bring folks together. Mm -hmm. And we came up with this Building Solidarity Program, which we're going to pilot on Thursday afternoon after our board meeting. And if it works, we will do it again at the convention. And the ultimate goal is, is to put it in the hands of member trainers, because we'll never get it done through our UT department if they just done enough bodies. And if we can get it out far enough and low enough in our structure, the conversations will substitute for the lack of five days locked up in the Concord. Sure. But we'll have to see how it works. We have our fingers crossed about it. Sure. But it's those kind of things that, that I try to instigate. And fortunately, um, Danny is very supportive, because I, this couldn't have happened without his, his OK. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, we'll found one of these days, we'll find something or some things mm -hmm. that work. Because not everything works everywhere and build that new base of, of, of activists and leaders that we're losing through retirements or disinterest. Yeah. We're finding it very difficult to recruit young, young people into the activist role. Yeah. Uh, people have other things to do. A lot of young people were finding, well, I'm here, give me my check, paycheck, I'm out of here. Yeah. People have lots of commitments, you know, children, second jobs, uh, you know, elderly or affirmed parents, you know. And giving up an hour or so to the union isn't, if I got a spare hour, I'm going bowling or I'm going to just sit and relax or, it's, it's very yeah. difficult. Yeah, it's, it's funny because in the past when you joined and you, got, and you felt that empowerment, you wanted to do more. And you're an example of that. And it seems to me that's unionism. But it, it's, yeah. it's, uh, for some reason it hasn't rubbed off. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. sure what the reason is. Part of it, well, maybe I do. Part of it is the culture. I said to you before, I don't like to do things for people. Mm. I like to show them how they can do it. 
Um, I mean, and that's not saying I don't do a favor. If somebody says make a phone call for me and I, only I can do that, I do that. But it's, it's better in the long run to show somebody how it gets done and they get, then they learn to do it themselves and then they can teach somebody else. Others uh, support the philosophy of the, what we call in, in the union business the service model. Mm. If I do everything for you and you're totally dependent on me, now you're totally loyal to me as well. Mm. And when it comes time for a vote, you're going to remember that I did everything for you, and if I don't support you and I'm not there, then who's going to do for you? That also not only, maintain, it not only maintains the current leadership, but it also makes for a very lazy membership. Right. Why should I do it myself when you can do it for me? It, yeah. Isn't that what we pay dues for? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the culture, the majority culture, I think, in, this, in the union. And it, I don't know that it's prevalent only in our union. Uh, I've heard stories yeah. of other organizations. Sure. Uh, the Central Labor Councils are another example where it's a core group mm -hmm. and everybody else could care less. And it's not really different from CSEA. Mm -hmm. There's really a, there's a need to move the labor movement into the organizing model, which is the other buzzword that we use, mm -hmm. to help people learn how to do it make them understand that they, every one of them, yeah. is, is, the, uh, is the union. It isn't me, and it's not Danny, and it's not Jerry. Right. It's every person who's got a card. I told a group of people one night not too long ago, which got half the crowd laughed and the other half frowned at me. It, do, it makes about as much sense as going to the bowl, joining a bowling league having everyone, uh, uh, not going once, but having someone bowl for you every, every time there's a game or a tournament, and then wondering why you didn't get the trophy at the banquet. I mean, you can't do that. And it's the union isn't any different. If, if you're standing up against the management, as well as your leadership and your other coworkers, how strong does the management not see you? But if it's only one individual, I mean, we had that problem in 99 when we had a contract problem in the state workforce. Mm, yeah. It was Danny against Goliath. Yep. And it was all Danny's fault because it wasn't a good deal the first time around. Yeah, right. Well, we got them finally into the groove that him standing there by himself meant nothing to Pataki. He's standing there at, with everyone around him chasing Pataki. I mean, we had members chasing Pataki. We had AFSME members that George went out west, and I don't recall which state he went to, North Dakota or South yeah. Dakota or somewhere, Wyoming. AFSCME members were there, yeah. and I thought, I guess he really could not believe there they were in his face. But that also showed the AFSCME connection, the power of the AFSCME connection. And a lot of people got into the mindset that maybe I do have to contribute something mm -hmm. on my own behalf. You know, it's not just... I'm not the union I'm really standing up for. It's me, my rights, my benefits, my thing. But then we lost it. We had it to a pitch, uh, and then it just sort of faded. It didn't institutionalize. It didn't gel yeah. for some yeah. reason. And we're taking the approach this time a little more slowly. Um, instead of, you know, we, that was a, I mean, we had to put that mobilization piece together so fast it would make your head spin because we yeah. didn't know the contract was going to go that way that fast. And when I got back from, I, had, I was at Harvard at the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, I came back and walked into that, and I had a great time with that project. Yeah. That was a lot, of, because we got to do a lot of innovative and different things we'd never tried before. But we put the onus back on the locals. You, this is what we need you to do. Now yeah. you go out and do it. Some responded, others did not. Mm -hmm. I think some of those who did respond are a little stronger now than they were back then. But unfortunately, it didn't spread far enough, and it never got down to the local government side mm. because they really weren't involved in the state contract negotiations. That wasn't really anything that came, had anything to do with them. So that sounds like that's the key, I mean, to the future. Because that's from the history of CSEA to the future. It's but it's got, somebody's, kind of somebody, more than a couple people yeah. have to buy in. Mm. and. It's, there's just not a buy-in, mm. and it's both on the mm, activist side and on the staff side. We've tried so many projects. We've yeah. over the last few years 
trying to stimulate an interest or uh, more activism, and it never gets out of the chute. It never. It only goes so far. It's what the staff affectionately calls the flavor of the month. Well, you got to try what you got to try. You know, but well, I, if we had the magic bullet, I wish I know. Uh, we don't. Nobody does. You can't start a trend. You have to accelerate a trend. So if there's any kernel of anything out there, I mean, this is what I take from my, my background is advertising and marketing, and that's what advertising does: is take a trend and accelerate it. You can't just give them a new concept. But it's unionism is a great concept. It's been around for a long time. And I think there must be a way to get people to understand that paying your dues doesn't just mean money. But you I don't, know? you know, that's a great phrase. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm selling you now. <laughs> so you can take that Thursday and, and play with it. It does, it means a lot more than Oh, I know than it does, I know it does. Dues. And that's what you've been talking about. You've certainly done it all your, your career. And there's a lot of other people who've done it more than I do. Yeah. There are people who give up so many family sure. things. I don't have any kids. I don't have a yeah. spouse. I have my cats, and you know, the, I do feel every once in a while that I'm neglectful, but people have given up holidays. I remember Pat Crandall saying to me, Pat Crandall used to be an activist in Region 5, mm. and she said to me, her own mother used to tease her and say, I'll probably have to have my funeral at your convenience around the union's events. <laughs> <laughs> and Pat said to her, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> You got any other final thoughts for us? Because I think not at the moment. All right. Well, you know, th we've started. We've actually primed the pump this hour. You, you're going to start remembering a lot more things. Write them down. Make notes because we can do this again. Okay, okay. Can All I right? have my water?